EU law takes uh, precedence over Irish law and over the Constitution. That's a basic tenet on which the uh, European Union, European Communities was founded, even though it was really, uh, it was not until, uh, so the primacy point was decided uh, by the Court of Justice, um, slightly controversial at the time, slightly in the, in the sense, I mean, this, we're going back 50 years, um, in the sense that um, certain member states uh, argued against the primacy, certain constitutional courts questioned the primacy, uh, but everybody in the end agreed and acted as if there was primacy. Uh, so without going into any historical tensions, which never had any practical effect on the application, uh, the substantive application of European Union law in every country, it's epitomized the, uh, in Ireland. The primacy of EU law in Ireland is epitomized by the, the manner in which we uh, signed up to the various treaties. We had to have a referendum to amend the Constitution because we were transferring sovereign powers of legislation, executive powers and judicial powers to I institutions uh, in the EU. And the provisions, the amendment says uh, to the con that nothing in this Constitution may be invoked to invalidate anything consequential upon our membership of the European Union. That's in substance what it says. So you can't invoke the Constitution according to the Constitution's own terms um, against uh, EU law. EU law has precedence and the Lisbon Treaty, which is now the governing treaty and consolidating treaty of the European Union, has express uh, provision for primacy over national law and therefore over Irish law. Um, the EU Convention on Human Rights has been an enormous success. Um, it's been there since the 1950s. Um, it has uh, thousands of cases which have uh, found governments to have failed in their obligations to respect human rights, due process, hu um, inhuman and degrading treatment, right to life. I mean, for example, not just that there might be an arbitrary uh, killing or there might be a, somebody might die in police custody, but the right to life en encompasses a duty of the state to investigate killings adequately. Um, uh, it was the source of the first decision which prohibited effectively extradition from a convention member state to a state where the person being extradited might be subject to the death penalty. It's been come, uh, so successful in requiring the elimination of forests of legislation that impinged on human rights. Not always, uh, by no means in a, in, in a gross way, uh, but in a significant way, and sometimes in a gross way, um, uh, a whole swathe of laws have had to be changed and practices introduced in order for states to comply. Uh, so when I say it's a victim of its own success, it's inundated with work. It has a backlog of tens of thousands of cases. And also, every, everyone who has a complaint real or imaginary, uh, but even if it's real, it might be admissible because it's too old or they haven't tried to seek a remedy in their own country, sends a complaint to the court. Up to the 1st of August, they had something like 54,000 complaints lodged with them. That's since the 1st of January of this year. They have managed, how they managed to do it, I don't know, to dismiss uh, 52,000 as inadmissible and decide 2,000 odd cases. Um, so it's also a source of controversy as to some laxity uh, in its method of interpretation of going beyond the bounds of what is permissible in um, uh, ruling on certain areas of conduct by governments, but uh, that's a different matter. It has been very effective, been a very effective for Western Europe, 
uh, it is still very effective for Western Europe and obviously it is of prime importance and has been as the former communist countries of Central and Eastern Europe um, uh, bring their systems into line with modern democracies uh, and um, is a source of important remedies for many people in those countries as well as in, as well as in the Western countries. Well, I think it would be controversial only if we had a rule against using foreign judgments. It is quite normal for counsel advocates in the course of their argument to refer to um, foreign judgments on similar issues under similar constitutions. Um, certainly they're often not relevant because there's a, dist obvious, a distinction between the provisions of the Constitution of Ireland and other constitutions. But in other, some cases, in quite a significant number of cases, there are common concepts, uh, common principles that are uh, common because they're inherent in any constitution based on the rule of law. And it does, it's, it's an enriching um, method of uh, informing oneself on the various perspectives that one might have on a particular legal issue. Comparative law, that's the use of foreign judgments, can uh, remind one of uh, aspects of an issue that were being overlooked, uh, aspects of an issue that hadn't been looked at in the same way before. Uh, Chief Justice Barak of Israel said that uh, looking at cases from other countries, judgments of other Supreme Courts, is like looking in the mirror. It's a way of understanding myself a bit better. And because um, other democracies encounter much the same issues, like right to die, the status of marriage, the status of the family, positive discrimination. Uh, it is enlightening uh, to see how other Supreme Courts resolve those issues, always bearing in mind that one is interpreting the national constitution. So um, informative as foreign judgments may be, a national judge is the filter through which knowledge of that nature or of any nature comes uh, comes through in in uh, uh, and that judge the national judge knows nonetheless that any constitutional interpretation he gives must be an anchored in the precepts and provisions of his or her own constitution so uh, looking at foreign judgments is not some Trojan horse that will corrupt the national constitution it is um, simply uh, additional knowledge that is informative uh, to, the to, to the interpreting judge without calling in question the integrity of his own constitution.